Hello, 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 welcome back, welcome back to my channel, glad you can join me, glad you can be here, the Cheryl Hubbard Show, uh, yes, uh, first, uh, I want to say glad that you can join me, glad you can be here, uh, I want to, uh, first of all, first and foremost, I want to give honor to God, God, I want to thank you for everything that you do for me in my life, thank you for waking me up this morning, starting me on my way, and um god i want to say um thank you thank you for um you know blessing me praying for me pray for my youtube friends youtube family so i'm glad you all could join me glad you could be here so um you know just want to start out you know you know just giving a few you know just giving them basically a little you know a little updated information or basically just a little information on the, uh, you know, the coronavirus. So, I know everybody probably watching the news. You know, you watch the news on a daily basis. Uh, we are listening to the CDC, um, you know, CDC Center for Disease Control, uh, 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 World Health Organization. Uh, you know, we listen to them on a daily basis. We have, you know, their website is up. You can go and always get all the information that you need. Um but um, I've been watching the news all day, so, you know, I watch it, you know, on a daily basis. So, just want to give a few, uh, you know, I want to just mention a few things that I took from the news. And um, I'm still watching the news, so I usually watch it all the way up until probably about 6.30. So, um, uh, information I do have is, uh, well, right here in Washington, D.C., libraries are closed. Um, uh, see, and also I have, um, new restrictions on, uh, D.C. restaurants. Um, they want you to stay, uh, well, actually, uh, yesterday, yesterday they said they wanted you to stay six feet apart so that they still probably, you know, that's still probably in effect, but also, uh, restaurants are closed. Only, only, they only deal with, uh, pickup, you know, in other words, takeout. So they are not allowing, you know, they close the restaurants and they closing the bars. So they only dealing with uh, if you order something, you can go pick it up, take it out. So and they probably won't even let you come inside. So those two things right there, libraries are closed, and I'm trying to see do it say uh, on a date. It doesn't have a date. Okay, so we got the libraries closed, we got the bars and the restaurants closed. Uh, oh, and then, uh, on the news I heard earlier that, uh, San Francisco, California, uh, they ordered to stay in their homes for three weeks, and, um, like, as I said, restaurants and bars are closing, and in Virginia, restaurants and bars, they close on their own, and then we, uh, we, we, they consider this an economic, uh, disaster, it, uh, it has, be, it has been declared an economic disaster, uh, has to be declared before, oh yeah, it has to be declared before the businesses can get uh, loans, but it has been, oh, I mean, it's, they didn't say it was an economic disaster, but they said it was an epidemic, so, um, but businesses uh, still are going to be, because Trump had this little, uh, what you call it, press conference today, and his medical team, so they are talking about uh, businesses being able to get loans, and, and, you know, businesses being able to get loans, because their customers, they are not getting any customers. They're not making any money. Nobody's coming in. Everybody, we have the, you know, this social distancing and hand washing. So it's very important. It's very important. And um, so another thing I have is, um, yeah, they say Falls Church Schools uh, will be closed till mid-April. Uh, PG County, it said PG County, uh, they'll be closed till April the 6th. Uh, but if I, it may be longer than that. And then it say, um, Prince William County schools will be closed until April the 14th. And, um, Maryland bars and theaters going to be closed. Um, and then we have, uh, let me see. Let me see what else I have. Uh, 
And then I have, uh, oh yeah, okay, and then the Kennedy Center, they have closed and just heard that on the news, the Kennedy Center right here in Washington, D.C., they are going to be closed uh, because they are, they're going to be closed till May the 10th, 2020. Uh, so that's the Kennedy Center right here in Washington, D.C., because they say they're trying to prevent the spread. So a lot of these places are closing down to prevent the spread, you know. They want to prevent the spread, so I mean, you know, that's that's a good idea. Preventing the spread, that's what I had said previously. In order to prevent the spread, and some people are not adhering to the World Health Organization uh, and the uh, CDC's recommendations because they had on the news. They said some people are not adhering because that virus, this virus is spread so quickly. It spreads so quickly. So they're uh, urging people, you know, so I'm in a house. I've been in a house. I be in a house every day, so I'm trying to keep my social distance uh, and keep washing my hands, you know, and everything. So, but um, then another thing, let me see what else I have on here. Uh, then I have, uh, oh, I see, I see, uh, I have a uh, ACC Child Development uh, uh, Center will be closed till April. And uh, Maryland schools, uh, they might be closed two weeks, two weeks or longer. Uh, D.C. public schools and Fairfax County schools, D.C. public schools and Fairfax, Fairfax County schools, they also closed. And then we have um, uh, Romney. Romney proposes giving $1,000 to every American adult as a coronavirus uh, response. So they, in other words, they know, you know, in Trump's press conference, he were, he, he, he was talking about uh, you know, Americans not, you know, Americans can't go to work. You have to keep that social distance. A lot of place, places closing down so the virus won't spread. So people are needing money to pay rent, uh, uh, buy, you know, toiletries, uh, food, different things, you know. Uh, uh, some people can't pay for the daycare and there's so many, you know, if you're off work. I know a friend of mine that lives upstairs in my building, she said, uh, they... Uh, her job, you know, made them go home, so they got two weeks off. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's understandable. This is the only way to stop the spread. Because if everybody's out and about moving around, and, you you know, you're close to one another, and you come, you're coming in constant contact with one another, that is a way to make this virus, this coronavirus spread. So, you know, so it's, it seems like it's a change every day. So everything gonna probably be cut, shut down. So they, uh, Trump is, you know, he asked Congress for a certain amount of money. Uh, uh, I forgot how much, but I know it's in the billions. And so uh, they can, you know, do get this testing, get these uh, supplies, uh, these coronavirus kits, you know, the supplies for those, and then they want to send a check to every. Uh, American household, so all the you know American residents. So that is a good idea because if they can't, if people like us and you and you and you and you know out there and you know all over the world, we can't go out and go to work. We need we have to buy we have to buy food, we have to pay rent, and we have our bills to pay. Uh, so and uh, another thing, let me see. I think this is the last one. Uh. Yeah, they are going to be offering, uh, uh, you know, businesses are going to be able to get loans because some of them, some people, they were on, they was, they was on their, you know, they were on the news talking that they may have to shut down because, um, you know, their business is slow and this social distancing and if you can't, you have, you have to be six feet, first they said be six feet apart, but now they're saying, you know, they just shutting it down all together. And shutting it down all together. The zoo has been shut down here in Washington, D.C. Um, um, restaurants, bars shut down. Uh, even restaurants, um, you know, you can, you know, no seating. They had one restaurant on there where they took the table, they took the tables and the chairs up. So the people, when they come in, you don't know where to sit. So they give you an idea, hey, you know, come pick your food up. Don't get comfortable. You get your stuff and go. And they're probably going to have it where, you know, you can't even go inside. You just, you know, maybe pull up to the window and you order your food and you just get your bag and go. 
It says, um, Romney proposes giving a uh, thousand to every American adult as coronavirus response response measure. Uh, grants to uh, and they want to give grants to affected small businesses uh, measures uh, amid amid at easing financial burdens uh, for students during this time and actions to bolster health services amid the outbreak. So and um, so they also saying that um, they want to help the businesses and the students as well. So you know the students are doing this online learning. So all classes are going to be online. You got American University. Um, who else did they say? American University. And I believe Howard University right here in Washington, D.C. So it did say Congress passed a multi-billion dollar uh, response package. So that way Trump, well, you know, since he uh, considered it a national disaster and it is a, um, is a was it an epidemic? So it's an epidemic, a national disaster that enabled him to be able to request more funding so he can help the American people. Uh, and then on the news, they have a lot of places that's giving out, you know, uh, food. They're delivering food, but they, they'll put it right in front of your door. So they're, you know, still creating that social distance. So it's, they'll, they'll put the food, you know, if you uh, order some food, they just put it right in front of your door so you don't have to even interface with them. And then they're encouraging people to check on your, uh, you know, check on your neighbor. Check on your neighbor and see, because we don't know who, um, we don't know who, um, you know, may need some help. So check on your neighbors. See if your neighbors need any help, because in this day and time, you know, it's something else, I tell you. It's something else. But um, let me see what else I have on the paper. I think this, let me see. Uh... Oh, and another thing, um, you know, you, when you want to, if, you know, I guess we all should be, you know, cleaning our homes. So, in other words, if you, you're going out to check your mail, say, for instance, you're going out to check your mail, you go check your mail, or you're just going to your car and come back, you know. So, uh, I did a little research online, just give you a list of things that you can uh, disinfect, sterilize. So you can, you know, your light switches, your doorknobs, uh, house keys, car keys, cell phones, landline, land, landline, refrigerator handle, uh, oven knobs, small kitchen appliances, uh, drawer pulls. So in other words, you got your drawer pulls. You open your drawer, you got your drawers in the kitchen, you may have your drawers in the bedroom. Uh, Sink knobs, uh, sink knobs. I don't have no sink knobs, but it say sink knobs, bathtub knobs. Oh, I guess you. Oh, well, not knobs, but you know the faucet. I have the faucets that you turn on. So they saying like when you wash your hands, instead of putting your hands back on the faucet after you finish washing your hands, instead of putting your uh, instead of putting your um, hands back on the faucet. After you wash your hands, you know, use a paper towel or, you know, something like that. Or some kind of cloth or something. So that's how you do that. All right, then we have the bathtub knobs. Oh, and also makeup and uh, brushes. Makeup and brushes. So just imagine, your, ma just imagine your makeup and your brushes, you know, so that can be germs. So I never, you know, I don't wear makeup, so, but, you know, the people that wear makeup, you still have to make sure your brushes are clean. Uh, bottles of hair care, excuse me, bottles of hair care or skin care, uh, toilet, uh, toilet flusher, so in other words, you flush your toilet, and then, you know, you flush your, you use the bathroom, you flush your toilet, you have to make sure that flusher is clean, and wash your hands real good, so it's almost like you use the bathroom, then wash your hands, you, well, you can, you can do, you use the bathroom, wash your hands real good, and then flush your toilet, but you still gonna have to wash your hands again. So, uh, toothbrush, hairbrush, uh, bathtub, uh, bathtub knob, uh, and then you have your desk, your com your computer screen. All these things can be wiped off. Computer mouse or laptop touchpad, computer keyboard, Windows, 
uh, mirrors, TV remote. So you constantly flipping on your remote. Like me, I got my remote. So when I finish in here, first thing I do when I when I get up is go back and wash my hands again. Uh, car door handle, steering wheel of your car, uh, dash of your car, uh, gear shift of your car, uh, radio and air vents. Uh, rear, rear view mirror, the rear view mirror of your car. So those are some things that you may consider, you know, but if you don't move around a lot and you may, you know, you might not need to do all of these things, but just a list that I found on, uh, on, uh, when I did my little research. Uh, so yes, yeah, so for President Trump and his, uh, medical team, so he was asking for, uh, cert, another package, a certain amount of money from Congress, so they can send all the Americans these, uh, you know, every every American household or all, you know, all American residents this uh, check, you know, a check. Because you know, if you are, if you can't go to work and everything shut down, and you have to pay your bills. You have your toiletries to get. Uh, you have um, you know, toilet paper, soap, deodorant, toothpaste, food. Rent has to be paid. Bills still have to go on. So, uh, and let me see, uh, I think that is it. Oh, and one more thing, a couple more things, uh, Metro right here in Washington, D.C., Metro Train, the Metro Transit, uh, they are, uh, Metro, uh, they, are, they are operating on a schedule. The schedule is every, the train was supposed to come every 15 minutes. Uh, and they, uh, yeah, okay. So that is the last one. So let me, uh, I get sometimes when I'm talking, I get, uh, you know, mouth get a little dry. So I have my, uh, so a lot of times I have my drink, but I like to put it in my, you know. So, you know, it's a, you know, Sprite. So I have to have my, you know, and I also have my, uh, you know, my Lala. And this is good because I'm trying to build up my immune system. So this has, uh, what's that, uh, five grams. Mm-hmm. Five grams of protein. See, I'm still watching the news. Kevin Durant and, Durant and three other Brooklyn Nets have tested positive for coronavirus. Kevin Durant. See, so it's just changing every day. Yep. Three others. Three other Brooklyn Nets. I ain't never heard of the Brooklyn Nets. Mm hmm So when something like that happens, sometimes they may have to quarantine the whole team. They say, if you are tested and you are positive, then you have to, uh, the whole, uh, you know, you have to quarantine right in your home. So, um, Idris Alba, Idris Alba, he was, uh, tested and he is positive and then his wife, she gonna have to be tested. She, well, basically she gonna have to be quarantined in the whole house for him and still probably be tested. Mm-hmm. So this is, social distancing is very important. So they are having, so I'm not going to anything. Today's Tuesday, tomorrow's Wednesday. I'm just in here and by myself, my YouTube slash uh, music studio right here in my home. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm going to listen to the CDC, the World Health Organization, and I'm going to listen and I'm going to do the best I can. Because this thing is serious. It's nothing to play with, you know. So you all just, you know, do it, do what you're supposed to do. Listen, adhere to the, you know, these uh, these doctors. They know what they're talking about. And so I'm just watching the news. Gary McGrady right there. And I'll see Metro. That's Washington, D.C. Uh, that's our Metro. That this, is, this is one of our Metro trains. Uh -huh. So they... I think they are limited, limiting their service services too to cutting down their hours and so they can keep things clean. See, uh, coronavirus metro slashing service due to slowing demand. 
a lot of people probably not riding. And what in the metro did say, um, if you're sick, stay off the train. If you are sick, stay off the train. Find another way, you know. And they're telling people, even if you have doctor's appointments, if it's not really that important, you know, you know, because we, me and my son, we have a dentist appointment Thursday, but I'm more than likely going to reschedule. And I probably won't go for another couple months, you know. So we did our physical. He did his physical appointment uh, about a week or two ago. Oh, he did the physical, so, but the dentist appointment, so they said if it's not, essential you know then you know because you don't know you don't even know the. we got to make sure the doctors don't have it when you're sitting there and you're getting waited on by the doctors uh that is you know everything is so scary because some doctors i think there's one doctor now that does have it and then you remember the other doctor he didn't make it so this is something you know it's really you have to we have to listen so i'm trying my best to listen mm-hmm well, I am trying my best to listen. So that's the uh, metro train station right here. So this is, oh, that looks like uh, uh, Virginia. Metro slashing service due to slowing demand. Because a lot of people, because, you know, you, you don't want to be all up on top of nobody. You riding the train. So I don't know, in other words, I mean, I guess you can, I mean, hopefully it won't be, cr if it's not crowded. Well, sometimes metro usually get crowded, but I guess at this time they're probably not crowded. But see, if they were crowded and everybody all over on top of one another, how are you going to be six feet away? So you can't be six feet away, but if you had a chance and somebody, I mean, you're not trying to be funny or nothing, but you're just listening to the doctors, you know, you're sitting in one spot and then, I mean, somebody, you get on the train and somebody already sitting there and then you just try to be, you know, six feet away. You know, you try to be six feet away and say, look, are they sitting over there? I'm going to sit a little further down from them. Mm-hmm. So what I do even when I check my mail, I'll make sure ain't nobody in the hall. I'll look out my peephole. I look out my peephole and then, you know, go on, put my gloves on, check my mail, come back in, take my gloves off, and wash my hands. Wash my hands real good. So I'm still concentrating on all inside, all the way around, fingernails, thumbs, 20 seconds. I try to, you know, keep my, uh, try to drink plenty of green tea. You know, I woke me two boxes of green tea when I went to the store a couple weeks ago. Me and my son, we went to the store, so try to get, we tried to get everything we needed to get so we don't have to run back. Because, see, if you're in a grocery store, you can't be six feet away because you got to get in line. So, you have to get, you have to get in line and then you're not going to stand six feet behind nobody in a grocery store because somebody's going to get in front of you and take your face. So we got everything. Well, actually, my son went. I didn't go. My son went and got everything. Because, uh, you know, he way younger than me. So he, him and his girlfriend, uh, fiance, they went. And they got, you know, I told him get everything you need for two weeks so you don't have to go back. So he got, you know, some items for me. Boy, to my door. And, uh, you know, so it's just, um, it's just, you know, it's just something, you know, it's just something different that we are dealing with. We never had to deal with anything like this in our lifetime, you know. Not that I can remember, you know, not that I can remember. So, it's a little Sprite. So, just, you know, keep your um, mouth lubricated. So, I was reading this uh so just a little, you know, a few little things on the coronavirus update. So now I just want to read a little bit out the book that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Oh, uh, look. Soap opera sustained production. Okay, uh, soap opera, soap opera suspending their, uh, suspending their shows. So this book right here, just a, you know, 
business law. I want to just read a, uh, you know, a few little things out of this book. So, um, let's read up on uh, entrapment. Okay, if a law enforcement officer induces a law-abiding citizen to commit a crime, entrapment may be used as a defense. Uh, it says the crime would not have been committed had it, had it not been for the inducement of the officer. The defense of entrapment is not available to a defendant who would have committed the crime without the involvement of the officer. So in other words, entrapment, you have to be a law-abiding citizen. You have to be a law-abiding citizen. Excuse me. You have to be a law-abiding citizen to use the defense of entrapment. In other words, uh, you would not have otherwise uh, committed that crime uh, because you are a law-abiding citizen. So, in other words, the officer induced uh, you into the officer induced you into. Uh, See, because it said the officer induces a law abiding citizen to commit a crime. So if the officer induce, induces you into committing that crime, you would not have ordinary, a crime that you would not have ordinary, ordinarily committed because you are a law abiding citizen. But if you would have done it, if they figured that you would have did it, then, you know, that, you know, then you could not use the defense of entrapment. See, because it said the person using the defense must show that the crime would not have been committed had it not been for the inducement of the officer. The defense of entrapment is not available to a defendant who would have committed the crime without the involvement of the officer. That's just like a uh, person, uh, you got a drug addict person, and they constantly buying, you know, they, they're not a law abiding citizen. You have a you have a person buying drugs, and they ordinary, they keep on buying them, and they buying them, and they buying them. And they are buying them, and they are not a law-abiding citizen, so they could not use the defense of entrapment because they, you know, they smoking drugs, they using drugs, or selling or whatever they doing. They would have done that anyway, so they could not use the defense of entrapment because they are not a law-abiding citizen. So somebody like you know me, for instance, I'm not. I don't use drugs or. Um, you know, I don't use drugs or smoke drugs or none of that. So, you know, I could use that defense, you know. But um, that's what it says. Uh, it says, um, if a law enforcement officer induces, see, that's the, the key word, induces a law-abiding citizen to commit a crime. So if he induces a law-abiding citizen to commit a crime, they can use that uh, defense of entrapment because they would not have ordinarily done it because they are a law-abiding citizen. So, um, let's see what we have here. And the next one we have, um, it was a word, it was, uh, let me see, let me see what else I have. I read over that one yesterday. Okay, let's look at kidnapping. Uh, the unlawful abduction of an individual against a person's will is known as kidnapping. Uh, it constitutes false imprisonment with an additional element of the removal of the victim to another place. Most state laws distinguish between simple kidnapping and the more serious offense of child stealing uh, or demands for ransom. Okay, here's a... Um, Here's, oh no, no, I don't want, I don't want to do this one. I, I, I think I skipped that one. I think I'll skip that one. Uh, I talked about this one. Let's talk about. I talked about that one yesterday too. Uh, let's see. Oh, I just read that one. Okay, let's see what else we have. Let's see what else I have. That we can. Okay, let's read a little bit about this. We have, okay, this is good. The pre trial uh, stage. After the answer has been filed, uh, the parties must await trial. During this waiting period, of the pre trial stage, uh, several activities can be carried out, including the pre trial conference, discovery, and the filing of pre trial motions. 
So it says, um, pre-trial conference. Some courts require, require cases to go to a pre-trial conference after, after the complaint and answer have been filed. Uh, at this meeting, the judge and the lawyers attempt to get the parties to settle their dispute to eliminate the need for a formal trial or to clarify the issues. If a settlement is not reached, a date for trial is set. Uh, discovery. The process by which the parties to a civil action search for information that is relevant to the case is called discovery. The objective is to simplify the issues and to avoid unnecessary arguments and surprise in a subsequent trial. Discovery techniques and tools include depositions, interrogatories, requests for documents, and other items of evidence for inspection, uh, requests for physical and mental examinations, and requests for admissions. Uh, a deposition includes an oral statement uh, made out of court under oath by witnesses or parties to the action in response to questions from the opposing attorneys. Uh, the answers are recorded by a court stenographer and can be used for later reference. Uh, interrogatories. Interrogatories are written questions that must be answered in writing under oath uh, by the opposite party. Interrogatories cannot be given to witnesses. witnesses. Only plaintiffs and defendants can be required to answer interrogatories. Uh, a request for real evidence. A party is asked to produce papers, records, accounts, correspondence, photographs, or other tangible evidence. The request uh, may also ask permission to go on and inspect land. A request for a physical or mental examination. Ask a party to undergo a physical or a mental examination. Such requests can be made only if the physical or the mental condition of the party is in controversy. In other words, it must be a central concern to the lawsuit. Uh, let's see, just trying to, you know, read some things I may find important. Okay, it says, upon completion of discovery, the pretrial conference, and any hearings held on pretrial motions, the case is ready for trial. So, in other words, it's a pretrial stage. So, pretrial means, uh, before the trial. Everything lawyers and defendants and, um, you know, and, you know, everybody that's involved in the case, everything they need to do before trial, pre-trial. So they need, uh, you know, gathering evidence, gathering evidence. They got a pre-trial conference. Um, see, some courts require cases to go to a pre-trial conference after the complaint and the answer. So somebody have a complaint against you and they send the paperwork and then you have to answer it. So complaint and answer. So we have a uh, pre-trial stage activities to be carried out, including the pre-trial conference, discovery, and the filing of the pre-trial motions. Uh, we had a discovery, the process by which the parties to a civil, uh, the search for information that's relevant to the case. It's called discovery. So searching for discovery, searching for all the information, uh, presenting the evidence. Uh, see, the objective is to simplify the issues and to avoid unnecessary argument, arguments and surprise in a subsequent trial. Discovery techniques and tools include depositions, interrogatories, requests for documents, you need all the documents, all your interrogatories, your depositions. So all that's basically it was considered evidence. Uh, and other items, there you go, and other items of evidence for inspection, requests for physical and mental examinations, and requests for admissions. So you need a pre-trial stage. In other words, you're getting ready for trial. You're gathering all your evidence. Lawyers on, lawyers on both sides gathering all the evidence. Uh, you need your, um, yeah, you need your, uh, you know, they be gathering their depositions, uh, interrogatories, and everything, you know, evidence, everything they need. You gather it. So pre-trial, before the trial. And then uh, upon the completion of this, after they do the discovery, gathering all the evidence, interrogatories, depositions, and all that, upon completion of discovery, pre-trial, and yet a pre-trial conference, and any hearings held on a pre-trial motion, the case is ready for trial. And then they begin to jury selection. Once it is decided that the case will involve a jury, the process of voir, voir dire to speak the truth 
uh, begins. In this process, the lawyers for both parties question prospective jurors to determine if they would be allowed to sit on the jury. Prospective jurors may be rejected if they are uh, unable to render an impartial judgment because they have some sort of relationship with the litigants or their witnesses. Yeah, I did uh, jury duty several times, and they do, yeah, they do ask you, uh, they do ask you questions, you know, when they're doing their, ver what you call it, very door selection, jury selection. So they ask you if you can be impartial and make sure you don't know. They ask you, you know, the judge will ask you, do you know the litigants? Uh, do you know the defendants? So if you do, you can't, you know, serve on that jury duty. Can't you serve on that jury, you know. Uh, opening statements, the plaintiff's case in chief, the plaintiff's case in chief, the plaintiff plaintiff's case in chief is his or her opportunity to present evidence uh, that would prove his or her version of the case to the jury. Uh, you got direct examination designed to present the facts uh, that would support the plaintiff's version of the facts. Uh, you got the defendant's place in, uh, the defendant, the plaintiff's case in chief, and also you have the defendant's case in chief. After the plaintiff has ended the presentation of his or her case in chief, uh, the defendant uh, then has the opportunity to present uh, his or her case in chief. So in other words, the defendant has to present their case in chief and the plaintiff have, have to present. The plaintiff has to present his case in chief. Uh, then you had a rebuttal and a sure rebuttal. Uh, so once the plaintiff and the defendant have presented their case in chief, each attorney may present uh, evidence to dis discredit the evidence presented by the opposition to, to the reestablishing credibility of his or her own evidence. So you got the rebuttal, the sure rebuttal. And each lawyer is going to try to uh, discredit uh, the evidence that the other lawyer is pre presenting for his client, his or her client. So that's how they go. They're going to try to discredit each other's, you know, evidence that they are presenting, you know, for the defendant. For the plaintiff, defendant. Um, and then we have, uh, so this is, um, this is, uh, let me see, this comes from, this is based on litigation. So in other words, like a civil lawsuit. So you're saying litigation. So in other words, you have your litigation, and then that's what I was talking about. You have your plaintiff, your defendant, you have your complaint. That this is all part of a litigation. Like litigation is like a, a civil lawsuit. Somebody suing you. Somebody suing you uh, for something, you know. So in other words, you have uh, you have your uh, answer, your affirmative defense. What is your what is going to be your defense? And I just read the pre-trial. After the pre-trial, before trial, then you come to the trial. Um, so that is for that. And that was basically basically like civil law. And then I come to this chapter is criminal law. So criminal law, we have a uh, crime is an offense against the public at large. And we have uh, I, I think I did this yesterday. So I won't go back over that. Um, so let me see. I don't think I read over this yesterday. Let me see. Let's talk about uh. Let's talk about uh battery. Battery involves an offensive or harmful, unprivileged touching. So that's what I was talking about yesterday, uh, my my previous video, my video yesterday. So, uh, unprivileged touching. So in other words, you touch somebody is unwanted. You touch somebody and it's unwanted, and you 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 know you touch them, you nudge them, you push them. You know it's unwanted. That's battery. But just to accidentally bump into somebody, you know, you just let them know, hey, I'm sorry, I apologize, I stepped on your shoe. But if you intentionally bump into somebody you intended to uh you intended to do harm you know so that would be a battery that's a crime so then i have uh 
We have defamation, any false statement communicated uh, to others that harms a person's good name. Any false statement is defamation. In other words, you go loud a person, you say, hey, uh, that person didn't finish high school or, you know, that person has a communicable, communicable disease. When they don't have it, then that's defamation. That's like defamation of character. And then you have slander. Uh, defamation in a temporary form, such as speech, is slander. So when you when you actually when you actually say uh, something defaming someone's character, that's slander. But libel is is written is written down. In other words, libel. It says in permanent form, such as writing, movies, video cassette, laser discs, and that's libel. So you say about somebody, you say, well, you know, he has a disease, and you go to down and they put it in the paper. They put it in the Washington Post paper that that person had uh, a communicable disease and they didn't have it. And, you know, so that's liable. You spoke, you spoke it with your mouth and you heard a mouth. You told somebody else about it and slander. So you can't go around defaming no one's character. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see what else I have in the book. And so we have assault, and assault occurs when the victim is placed in fear or apprehension of immediate bodily harm by a tortfeasor who has, a, has the present apparent ability to inflict that harm. So you tell somebody, I'm going to, uh, hey, you know, I'm going to bust you in your face. So that's, that's placing someone in immediate fear. That would be uh, assault. So assault occurs when a victim is placed in fear of apprehension or immediate bodily harm. So you have them fearing, you have them fearing for, you know, fear that you're going to do bodily harm to them. So you told them, man, I bust you in your face, blah, blah, blah. You know, that that's assault. But then when you actually hit them, that's battery. And then they have in, uh, false imprisonment where one party prevents another party from moving about freely. Uh, the first party has committed the intentional tort of false imprisonment. Uh, I think some of these I went over on, on my previous video. Went over in my previous video. I'm trying to see. Uh, well, oh, I have contributory negligence. Uh, the defense of contributory negligence involves the failure of the injured party to be careful enough to ensure personal safety. So in other words, you contributed to your own uh and you contributed to harming yourself you contributed to it uh it's a certain percentage a certain percentage it says uh contributory negligence completely prevents recovery by the injured party in other words if the injured party's negligence contributed to personal injury so your negligence if your negligence contributed to you injuring yourself then that's contributory, I mean, that's the case of this uh, contributory negligence. See, it says the tort fees of wins. It says the injured party's defense to a charge of contributory negligence is called last clear chance. Under this doctrine, a tort fees may be held liable if the injured party can show that the tort fees had the last chance to avoid injury. Uh, then we have comparative negligence. Comparative negligence statute that require courts to assign damages according to the degree of fault of each party. Uh, rather than deny uh, all recovery, the court weighs the relative degree of wrongdoing in awarding damages. Uh, if the tortfeasor was 80% negligent, the injured party may be allowed to recover for 80% of the losses suffered. Some states have adopted the 50% rule. Under this rule, an injured party who, who was found to be more than 50% negligent cannot recover any damages from the tort fees. Excuse me, it says, um, to soften the harsh effects of contributory negligence, many states have adopted comparative neg negligence. So if you're responsible for, if the tort fees is only responsible for, say, 80% of causing harm to you, then that's, and then you're responsible for 20% of causing harm to yourself, then the tortfeasor will only, you know, the is the one that committed the tort. That's an intentional wrong. So, 
just like you know, salt, a salt and battery. That is a torque. Mm -hmm. So, torque freezer would only have to you would only be recovered at eighty percent. Uh, so just still, you know, keep it up with the news at the same time. So let's see what else I have. Let's talk about uh so what about privity? Privity means that both parties both parties must have uh legally recognized recognized interest in the subject of the contract. So privity, you uh you are not you know, you are you are privy to that contract if you are a part of the contract. So you got two people and they have a contract, but a third person try to come and get in on the deal and try to voice their opinion, but they are not privy to that contract because they didn't have nothing to do with it. The contract only consisted of those two individuals right there. And that third person was not privy to their contract. It's just like and also you can be privy to a conversation. I could be having a convers I could be having a conversation with one young lady or one uh male person and just me and him having a conversation or me and her having a conversation but somebody else come along and they try to talk about make they try to uh make known or make people think that they had something to do with that conversation but they didn't they was not privy to nothing that was said you know it was me and another uh female or me and the other gentleman we had a conversation. We had a business conversation or whatever we were talking about, you know. And third person. So if you wasn't privy to that conversation, then it's like a contract, you know. You're not a part of that contract. You was not privy to that. You was not a part of that contract. You're not included in that contract. So it says, see, the general rule of contract law. Uh, the general rule of contract contract law is that the parties to a contract must stand in privity to one another. It says uh, privity means that both parties must have a legally recognized interest in the subject of the contract. So if you don't have a recognized recognizable interest in the subject of their contract, and you ain't had nothing to do with it anyway, you were not even in on it. They was in that room over there. They had a contract, they were discussing the, the rules and regulations of, they were discussing the, the uh, elements of the contract they were, you know, involved in. That other person didn't have nothing to do with the contract, so they was not privy to that contract. So, uh, you know, uh, just some memory bogger, uh, boggers, I guess. The jogging, memory joggers, you know, jogging your memory. Uh, let's see what else we have. I have, uh, oh, let's talk about, this is, uh, let me see, just a couple things, because I don't want to run out of time. They have a whole lot of, you know, other stuff, real property, chapter 22, real property, the nature of real property, uh, the ground and everything permanently attached to is real property. So in other words, you buy a house. If you buy a house and nine times out of ten, you uh you own the land that the house is on as well. You own the house and the land that's under it. So that's what they call real property. It says the ground and everything presently attached to it is real property. Uh it includes buildings, fences, and trees on the surface on the surface, earth, rocks, and minerals under the surface. And the airspace above the surface. Uh, and it said trees, flowers, shrubs, vineyards, and field crops that grow each year without replanting are considered real property. Uh, you got air rights, water rights, sub subterranean rights. See the owner, uh, the owner, uh, subterranean rights, the owner uh, rights, subterranean rights. 
Uh, the owner of land has exclusive title to material below the surface of the land. Uh, the right extends to a point determined to be the exact center of the earth. These, these subterranean rights are at times sold to corporations, corporations exploring for coal, oil, or other mineral deposits. We have water rights or air rights. See, in early England, landowners owned the airspace above their property to as high as the heavens. Really? I mean, you know, this law changed with the increased use of the airplane. Modern court decisions have held that landowners own the airspace above their land to as high as they can effectively possess or reasonably control. This height usually extends as high as the highest tree or structure on their property. It is a trespass for anyone to run wires through someone else's airspace or to use another's airspace in any way without permission. Electric and telephone companies must obtain easement uh, for the right to run wires through the airspace of property owners. Yeah, because that was, I was wondering, you know, I never even thought about it this way because, you know, sometimes, I know when I was looking at the court cases sometimes on uh, TV, like Judge Judy and different ones, you know, how they get get into it. Sometimes the neighbors be getting on each other's nerves when they have their fences. So, you know, in other words, your fence can't be so high because, or you got to make sure it has, a, you know, you have your surveyor so you won't interfere in no one else's land. But I never thought about airspace. So in other words, if they have a fence and I'm like, you can't have your fence but so high because you, you might be interfering with the, your neighbor's airspace. Never thought about that. See, I'm learning something every time. That's why I don't mind reading and doing my research because I always learn something new. Uh, it says air rights, water rights. People who own land along the bank of a river or stream are called riparian owners. Uh, they have certain rights and duties with respect to the water that flows over, under, and beside their land. Isn't there some owners of land through which a stream flows on the soil uh, beneath the water? If a non-navigable stream is a boundary line between two parcels of land, the owner of each side owns the center of the stream. If the stream is navigable, however, each owner owns only to the bank of the stream, and the bed is owned by the state. So, uh, you own some land by the water, then you have to, it would be determined how, you know, how much of that water stream belongs to your side of the property, your property. See, owners of, owners of land through which a stream flows own the soil uh, beneath the uh, water. So in other words, you got a stream flowing on your property, then you own that stream and the uh, uh, soil beneath beneath the stream. So water rights. So you see, a land a landowner must must not dig a cell a cellar or other evac or excavation so uh, so close to the boundary of a neighbor as to cause the neighbor's land to cave in or the neighbor's building to be damaged. Uh -huh. A person, a person uh, excavating who fails to shore up the adjoining land is liable to the neighbor for, for damages. So that's something else. So you have to be, you know, I never thought about that. Navigable, navigable, navigable airspace. So in other words, a tree belongs to the person on whose land the trunk is located. So if the trunk, you have a neighbor, and the trunk of a tree is on that neighbor's uh, land, but the branches flow over. You know, I got something. But the branches flow over in your yard, but the trunk of that tree is in your neighbor's yard. So that tree belongs to the neighbor. So that's what it's saying in the book. A tree belongs to the person whose who's land uh, the trunk is located. People who own adjoining land have the right to cut off trespassing tree branches in their airspace and trans, uh, trespassing roots at the boundary line of their property. So in other words, um, you have two people that own a house and they live next door to one another, but you have the trunk of the tree in one person's house uh, or on one person's property. You have the trunk of the tree in one person's property, uh, so that tree belongs to them. But the branches flow over to the neighbor's house, so now you're interfering with the neighbor's airspace.
So, you know, this is something, good information. That trunk of that tree is, is in your neighbor's yard. So that is not your tree. It's in your neighbor's yard. The trunk belongs to your neighbor because it's in your neighbor's yard. But the air, but it interrupts with, with your it interrupts with your airspace because the branches flow all the way over to your yard. So, you know, that's something else I'd tell you. But, you know, I said, you know, I never, I mean, I'm glad I read through this. I'm, that's why I always keep all my books. I kept all my books from when I was in school. Uh, so, uh, okay, I was talking about easement. And easement uh, is the right to use the land of another for a particular purpose. Easements are used to give people the right to pass over another's land, uh, to run wires to another's airspace, to drain water onto another's property, and to run pipes underneath someone else's ground. So in other words, you, you have an easement, also, also called the right of way. It's the right to use the land of another for a particular purpose. And it says, um, the property to which the right of privilege of easement attaches is called the dominant tenant, tenement. In contrast, the property through which the easement is created or extends is known as a servient, uh, servient tenement. An easement may be created in three ways, by grant, by reservation, and by prescription. So in other words, you can't, uh, you have to have an easement, you have to have permission to, uh, to use someone else's land. You have, a, you have the, use of, use, the right to use the land of another, another for a particular purpose. The easements are used to give people the right to pass over another's land. Uh, so in other words, you can't just walk over nobody else's property. You have to have an easement. You have to have uh, you can't run wires on nobody else's land or run off nobody. That's why people get mad. They're like, look, you know what? Don't walk on my grass. Uh, I'm trying to keep my my land up, my yard up. Don't walk across my grass. Don't run no wires over here. Uh, your tree branches coming over interfering with my my airspace in my yard on my property. So, so many things, you know. An easement by prescription is an easement that is obtained by passing over another property without permission, openly and continuously for a period of time set by state statute. So, uh, 20 years, uh, people claiming easements by prescription must show that they use part of another's property openly, notoriously, and in a hostile manner for the prescribed period. This proof is similar to that used in adverse possession, which is discussed later in this chapter. So, I mean, there's so many, so much, you know, I'm not going to read all this, but I'm just going over. And here was something to estate, estate in fee simple. Anyone owning real property outright, that is forever, is said to have an estate in fee simple. Uh, the estate descends on the death of the owner to the owner's heirs. The owner of an estate in fee simple has absolute ownership in the real estate uh, with the right to use or dispose of it as desired so long as the use of it does not interfere with others' rights. So uh, anyone owning real property are right that is forever and is said to have an estate in fee simple. So if somebody, I guess, left you somebody in your family passed away, then you have a right to uh, the property. So that's probably, that's probably one example. Estate in fee simple, because it says uh, the estate descends on the death of the owner, the owner dies, and then you have right to that property. It doesn't say nothing about a will or nothing like that. It doesn't say you have to have a will, but it say uh, it'll go to the owner's, the owner's heirs, your heirs, you know, so then we have uh, a, a dower, D-O-W-E-R, uh, life estates are sometimes created by operation of law, dower, and cur courtesy are examples. Years ago in England, dow dower was a right that a widow had to a life estate in one third of the real property owned by the husband driving uh, during the marriage. Courtesy was a right that a widower had. If children of the marriage were born alive to a life estate in all real property owned by the wife during this marriage, during the during the marriage, the rights of dower and courtesy were in addition to rights given to spouses under the law of wills. And like to estate in one third of the property owned by the husband during the marriage. So in other words, back in the day, they're saying back in England, 
if you marry somebody, you'll be have a right to one third of the property. Because it said dower and courtesy are, um, in other words, dower was a right that a, a dower was a right that the widow, the widow, the widow had to a life estate in one third of the real property owned by the husband during the marriage. So you marry somebody back in the day, and you have one third, you have a right to one third of the property during the marriage. Uh, then you have courtesy was the right that a widower had if the children of the marriage were born alive uh, to a life estate in all real property owned by the wife during the marriage. So I mean, it's something you know. I mean, so many different areas of law. Uh, then we have joint tenants when two or more persons own real property as joint tenants. In other words, you have uh, somebody passed away and um, they had three or four children and they passed the house down and all the property to uh, their three children. So there would be a joint tenant. They would call it a joint. That would be called a, a joint tenancy because it says when two or more persons own real property, the estate created is a single estate with multiple ownership. So just like uh, my, my mother passed away, uh, we had um, it was, uh, four of us, so we uh, were entitled to the joint tenancy. We all had a portion of the house. Uh, so let's see. Um, we have a general warranty deed, a special warranty deed. I'm not going to read all this, but a general warranty deed, sometimes called a full Full covenant and warranty deed contains express warranties under which the gar uh, grantor guarantees the property to be free of encumbrances created by the grantor or by others who had title previously. A special warranty deed contains express warranties under which the, the grantor guarantees that no, def no defect arose in, in the title during the time that the grantor owned the property. And we have tenancy by the entirety. Uh, may be held only by a husband and wife and is based upon the common law doctrine known as unity of person. Under this doctrine, a husband and wife are regarded in law as one. In theory, each spouse owns the entire estate, which neither can be destroyed by any separate act. It's so, you know, so many, you know, so much, but, um, I'll probably read some more later, so I already went over an hour, so I don't like to go too far. But um, we have Tennessee at will is an ownership interest in real property for an indefinite period of time. Tennessee for years uh, is an ownership interest in real property for a definite or fixed period of time. Uh, we got periodic Tennessee, Tennessee from year to year. Uh, Tennessee, a periodic Tennessee uh, is also known as a, as a Tennessee from year to year uh, to month or week or week to week is a Tennessee that continues for a successive period until one of the parties terminates it by giving notice to the other party. So you have a Tennessee uh, from year to year, you, uh, you, uh, you and someone else owning the property together and I guess uh, once that one of the, uh, one of the parties if one of the parties give notice, then that would be the only way that they would have to terminate their portion. Because uh, that's what it says. Uh, it could be a month to month or week to week. Uh, it says a uh, tenancy from year to year is a tenancy that continues continues for successive periods until, until one party uh, terminates it by giving notice to the other party. So once one other party gives notice to the other party, then they can terminate it if they want to. Uh, so I am not going on to read too much more of that, but, um, so I read, you know, uh, I met, you know, some more stuff on the coronavirus. So, you know, I wrote, read some more stuff. So this coronavirus is, you know, something else. And I want to say thanks for joining me today. I appreciate you joining me today. And, I, you know, just a little information. I'm still watching the news. Campaign amid a pandemic. So they're still trying to campaign. So 
we're dealing with this coronavirus and then you know we're trying to pick a president in november and they trying to you know they and then they they were in the you know biden and uh uh, what's it, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders? You see them at the um, uh, what you call it, the debate? They were standing six feet apart, so and, you know everybody uh recognizing and everybody is adhering to this um uh, six feet, the social distance, social distance, six feet away. So when they did their little um, and here is you got one hundred and ninety six thousand. 106 confirmed cases of the coronavirus, 7893, 80,840 total, oh, 80,000 recovered, 80,840 people recovered from the coronavirus, 196,106 confirmed cases. So, you know, but look how beautiful that is, that is beautiful. Cherry blossoms forming, and you know we still have a lot to be uh, thankful for. But um, um, we have a lot to be thankful for. So you know I get to talking about you know. So I want to say, um, YouTubers, thank you for joining me today. So thanks for joining me, and got a little warm up now because I had it sitting. But, uh, you know, thanks for joining me today. And, um, they still advertising for new cars and everything. So, you know, so it's still advertising for new cars. So we still have to have some type of, uh, you know, have to have something going on that still make us happy. Mm -hmm. But, um. Thanks for joining me today, and I was just reading on, you know, some, just reading some things out of my little law book, and, and then, um, yeah, some reading some things out of my law book, and I'm, you know, keeping up with the news, so cherry blossoms, they are blooming, and it was uh, rain late Wednesday night, so that's tomorrow, tomorrow Wednesday, late, rain late tomorrow, mm-hmm, but, um, I ain't gonna hold you too long, YouTubers. I want to say, you know, thank you for joining me today. Hope you come back again. The Cheryl Hubbard Show. And um, I'm just going to continue watching the news, get ready to go in here and see what I want to cook for dinner. And, um, you know, keeping up with this coronavirus, keep myself busy trying to keep building my YouTube channel up. Mm hmm. And um, so. Not much happening tonight, just, you know, probably watch the news, check out a movie, do a little more research and writing, you know, so I want to say thanks for joining me today, prayers to you, all you YouTubers, prayers to me, prayers to me and my family, and I want to thank God, God, thank you for everything you've done for me in my life, keep blessing me, blessing me and praying for me, pray for the YouTubers out there, prayers to all you, all that, that I'll Prayers to all of you that, that you know, that, that's watching my channel. Prayers to all of you YouTubers out there. So, you know, subscribe below. Uh, subscribe below. Uh, comment below. If you don't want to subscribe, comment. Continue to watch. You know, watch. I'm trying to create, you know, uh, quality uh, information on my channel. Educational, enlightening, uh, inspiring, motivating. So, you see Donald Trump, I, Trump, I was watching this earlier. So he has, you know, created his top flight medical coronavirus medical team. So, you know, what more can you ask? So I'm not going to hold you too long. Thanks for joining me. Prayers to you. Uh, we want to get rid of this coronavirus. We ask, I'm asking God to wash this coronavirus off the face of this earth. Don't never let it come back again. Prayers to you. Prayers to you. Prayers to me. Everyone around the world. And I want to say thanks for joining me. The Cheryl Hubbard Show. And, um, you know, God bless you. God bless me. God bless my family, your family. And I'll say, you know, I'll see you on my next video. So, 